ではゲノム情報ビッグバンによるあの東京大学大学院の講義を開始します。今回の講師はですね、えっと弟子らず七島ラオ先生、えっとインドあの科学研究所のプロフェッサー生命科学部門のあのダイレクターという方ですが、今あの東京大学の客員教授、外国人特任研究員、客員教授ということで1ヶ月東京大学に雇用されてあの私の研究室をご出席して滞在していらっしゃいます。えっと皆さんご存知と思いますけれども、あのラオ先生は3型と呼ばれる制限構造、就職構造の研究をあの作り上げてきた方で、3型の制限構造っていうのは。最近次世代水検査で資料のプレパレーションによく使われている構想ですあの非常に最近売れるようになりました認識配列からかなり離れたところを切断するという性質を持っているというです、ね、そういう研究があのそういう実用化が可能になったのは、まあ、ラオ先生の数十年にわたる努力と研究の意義のおかげでえっと、今日は2コマ分ですねフルにその制限構造とゲノムの命中化ということについて話していきたいと思います非常に勉強になる機会だと思いますではドクターラオプリーズ、well, First of all thank you very much、uh, uh, for having me here、uh, My visit to Tokyo and the university and the institute here has been possible because of the kind gesture of Professor Kobayashi. And I'm going to be here for a month,、uh, and I hope、uh, we will establish some collaboration between our two labs. So, once again, thank you very much for inviting me here, and thank you for coming for this lecture. What I'm going to do today is to speak on DNA methyl transferases. Enzymes which are very important both in prokaryotic systems and in the eukaryotic systems. But what I'm going to focus today is going to be in prokaryotic s y s t e m And DNA methyl transferases come in a variety of flavors. There are thousands of methyl transferases, DNA methyl transferases, in the prokaryotic world. But the common thing that these enzymes do is to catalyze the transfer of a methyl group onto DNA. All these 4,000 or 5,000 of my methyl transferases do the same kind of chemistry. But the, the way this, many of these methyl transferases do the chemistry becomes very interesting, and I'm taking a few examples which we study in my lab in a bit more detail. So, therefore, I'm sorry that the first thing is not very clear here. This is unity in diversity. So, there is a lot of diversity, but there is unity in the sense that it catalyzes the same reaction, and therefore it is interesting to study these enzymes. Now, DNA methyl transferases in the prokaryotic world are always in conjunction with something called the restriction modification phenomenon. And this, as most of you know here, that RM systems are primitive immune systems for the bacteria, for the bacterial world. While a phage infects here, for example, as you see here, when a phage, comes,、uh, uh, when a phage enters the、uh, bacterial cell, for example, a host here, the host's、uh, chromosome in turn、uh, makes、uh, enzymes called restriction enzymes which cleave this DNA, and its own DNA is protected by modifying it by methylation. And that, that is the role of DNA methyl transferases here, which protects its own genome. But when the foreign genome in the form of a bacteriophage or a virus comes here, this is completely cleaved because this is unmethylated. And this primitive、uh, uh, immune system, or the defense hypothesis as it is、uh, known, is, is one of the major functions of RM systems. But some very, very elegant work from Professor Kobayashi's lab here、uh, several years ago clearly showed that RM systems are selfish genetic elements, and the whole purpose of these.、Uh, Uh, presence of these elements has been very well described by Professor Kobayashi's work. I'm not going to go into details of that because this is well known and he has pioneered this whole concept in a very, very elegant manner. Now, ever since restriction modification enzymes were 
discovered by Werner Arbor and others, it became very clear that you have a variety of restriction modification enzymes. When you say restriction modification, the restriction is actually a endonucleus which cuts DNA and the modification is actually a methyl transferase which methylates DNA. And they come in a variety of forms. You will always find that the R and the M genes or the enzymes are always together. You cannot have an R alone, a restriction, because it's going to be lethal to the cell. The cell has the cell genome has to be modified before the restriction enzyme can be made or the endonucleus is made. Now, depending on a variety of properties which are listed here uh, on enzymatic activity, on subunit structures, on cofactor requirements, on recognition sequence, uh, sequence, the cleavage site, and DNA translocation, which I'll come to it later on, these enzymes have been classified into uh, four categories. Now, the current classification is uh, type 1s, the type 2s, the type 3s, and the type 4s. We won't go into details of it, but just to tell you that my laboratory has been focusing in the last 20 years on type 3 restriction enzymes. And the type 3 restriction enzymes are actually uh, shown here, uh, which have two subunits. Uh, the two genes code, uh, the rest gene and the mod gene, each of them code for two different polypeptides, but both the polypeptides have to come together before they can cut DNA. And when they cut DNA, you require not only the two subunits coming together, but you also require ATP and magnesium. And magnesium is common for all restriction enzymes, but the requirement of ATP is very unusual for type 3s and type 1 enzymes. And besides that uh, ATP and magnesium, my laboratory has shown in the last 10 years that s methionine, which is a methyl donor for methyl transferase, is also required for restriction activity. But there's some controversy on this because other labs do not find the requirement for a SAM cofactor for restriction. But we'll come to that later on. But what is important for this afternoon's lecture is that the methyl transferase activity, so the enzymes, because the type 3 enzymes, have three activities. I'm sorry, I should go here. And the three activities are the endonuclease activity, the methyl transferase activity, and because they use ATP and ATP is hydrolyzed, they also have an ATPS activity. So it is a uh, you know, two, substrate, uh, two subunit enzyme, multifunctional. It has three activities, so three active sites are present there. But interestingly, in the type 3 restriction enzyme, the R and the M have to come together in the form of an R2M2 complex. That is a restriction enzyme. It will cut DNA. But the M alone can act as a DNA methyl transferase in presence of s methionine would methylate a particular sequence and then methylation would occur. Whereas in the type 1 enzymes, you see there are three subunits, the R, M, and the S. All three have to come together to form a restriction enzyme. So unlike in type 2 enzymes, we have two polypeptides. One is a restriction enzyme and one is a methyl transferase. The type 1 and the type 3 enzymes are more sophisticated. They are multi-subunit proteins with multifunctional activities. And therefore, they're very interesting. But what is more interesting about the type 3 enzymes or the type 1 enzymes is that unlike the type 2 enzymes, which bind to a sequence and cut within the sequence, these guys recognize the sequence but cut away from the sequence. And they cut away from the sequence 20 to 25 base pairs in the case of the type 3 enzymes, as you see here. In the case of the type 1 enzymes, they can cut anywhere between 1,000 and 7,000 base pairs away. So for you know, for commercial purposes, for recombinant DNA technology, tools and all, these enzymes are not very useful at all because they are real pain in the neck to use this. But as far as uh, biochemistry is concerned and mechanisms are concerned, these are excellent model systems to understand how action is done at a distance. It's binding here and the action is somewhere else there. In both these cases, the type 1 and the type 3 enzyme, the binding is very specific. It has to recognize a specific sequence. But the cutting sequence, the cleavage sequence, is non-specific. It's 25 to 27 base pairs, and any sequence there it is going to cut. Whereas in the type 2 enzymes, they recognize the sequence and cut within the sequence. And most of the time, you'll find in the type 2 enzymes, the enzymes recognize palindromic sequences or symmetric sequences, whereas in the type 3, you will find in the type 1 that the recognition sequences are asymmetric in nature. There is no bipartite, uh, uh, there's no uh, 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 sequence symmetry that you find in these enzymes. 
I'm going to now focus only on the metal transferase portion of these enzymes. The restriction enzyme, I'm going to leave it for some time. Uh, maybe at the next occasion I can speak on it. But on the metal transferase is what I'm going to focus because my laboratory has been focusing, as I said, for the last 20 years on these metal transferases. And very quickly, I'll skip some of these slides just to tell you that metal transferases and DNA metal transferases come in two categories. The methylate acytosine or the methylate and adenine. If it's an adenine methylation, the N6 position is methylated, whereas it's a cytosine, either the ring C5 methylation or the N4 cytosine methylation. So in other words, metal transferases are of three kinds. The exocyclic metal transferases, which compose of N6 and N4, and the third one is the C5 or the ring metal transferases. Now, very early on, from a lot of work from Tom Trotner's lab in Germany and from Rich Roberts' lab and many other labs, it became very, very clear that if you arrange all the metal transferases, all the amino acid sequence of metal transferases, line them up, 1 to 4,000 or 5,000, you will find they are very domainal, very, uh, very well organized. There are boxes which are conserved and there are regions which are not conserved at all. And the regions which are not conserved are here, for example. And it is this region which is responsible for specificity. Now, in other words, you have a red box here, you have a red box in all the metal transfer. You have a yellow box, you have a green box, all these boxes. And in other words, you can actually interchange. You can take this half of it, take this sequence, and then take this half, you can change specificity. Nature has done it naturally, but in man-made uh, laboratories, scientists also have made these hybrid enzymes. And therefore, because of this domainal organization, metal transferases have become an excellent tool to manipulate, to understand protein DNA interactions. And that is one of the reasons that my laboratory also <coughs> has been working on these enzymes. This is in the case of the cytosine uh, C5 methyl transferases. Similarly, even in adenine methyl transferases, in the exocyclic methyl transferases also, you have very much conserved sequences. And what is common in all these methyl transferases, because they use s adenosyl methionine, there is a motive called the FXGXG motive, the SAM binding motive, which is present in all the metal transferases. You will see later on in our, the, the, uh, with our enzymes also, if you mutate any of these residues which bind SAM, then the SAM binding is completely lost. And that is how you show that these are. So it's very easy to identify uh, metal transferase in a genome sequence, for example, because these motives are very, very characteristic. This region here, which has no homology or very little homology, is known as the target recognition domain, the TRD. And the TRD is the one which is responsible for giving specificity for that enzyme, whatever enzyme that you're studying here. Now, Janusz Buzhnishki, who was here, who was a, who was a visitor here some time back, he, class, he did a lot of this bioinformatic analysis, a very good bioinformatic analysis, and found that Metal transferases, either the exocyclic or the endocyclic, C5 or the N6, can be actually subdivided into six categories called the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and the eta family. And this is depending on three sequences, three motives, the SAM binding motive, the TRD, and the catalytic motive. If you arrange these three in different forms, you can get six categories of different subfamilies of metal transferases. And no, a lot of examples are known for the alpha, for the beta, for the gamma and all, but there's no known example for this particular one, not yet. We have not yet isolated a metal transferase with this eta arrangement here, where the TRD and then the arrangement is there. For all the others, you have lots of examples, but for this, you don't have this. You have a, at least two or three examples for this, but for these, you have a number of examples, but for this, you have no example at all. So the eta family of metal transferases is still to be identified. Now metal transferases are, uh, they all do the same chemistry, right? They transfer the metal group from s adenosyl methionine to DNA, either to adenine or to the cytosine residues. But each of them, many of these enzymes which have been purified and kinetics have been done, do it in a different way. In some cases, the SAM binds first and then the DNA, or in some cases, the DNA binds first and then the SAM. Or in some cases, you'll find either the DNA or the SAM can bind here. So this is kinetics. And by doing regular you know, enzymology, you can determine the order of binding and the order of release of products. And this is all the random mechanism or the 
ordered by mechanisms and things like that. But again, you see, many of these metal transferases do it differently. The ultimate product is the same. The ultimate reaction, they do the same. But the way they do it is different, and therefore, there's diversity in, in this so-called unified family of family uh, enzymes that you have here. And that is the interest that many laboratories across the world are interested in studying these enzymes. There are good models to understand protein DNA interactions, and I'll come to that later. I'll skip these two slides because these are mechanisms, and the mechanisms have been quite well worked on. Now, the DNA methyl transferase whole area came into limelight in 1994 when uh, the crystal structure of the first methyl transferase was solved in uh, Rich Roberts' lab by Jodong and uh, Klimasaskis. And there in the structure, and I'll show you the structure, it became very clear that when you have a stretch of DNA and a methyl transferase binds to a particular sequence, it actually methylates a particular cytosine or an adenine among a lot of non-specific cytosines and adenines that are present here. But because the binding was so specific, it became very clear only from crystal structure and not from any other method that the base, the target base to be methylated is actually taken out. This is called as base flipping. In other words, the whole nucleotide is rotated 180 degrees out of the double helix, after the B form of DNA. And then the methyl group is added in the active site of the enzyme, and then the whole thing is put back here. So this became very nice, this became very clear when the structures of these methyl transferases were first solved. And in 1994, this very famous enzyme called the HHA1, which recognizes GC, GC, and the internal C is actually methylated here. This C is methylated. And you can see here from the structure that, you know, this C here is actually taken out of the double helix into the active site. The methyl group is added and then it's put back. In other words, just the binding energy is enough. You don't require external energy at all. You don't require bending. You don't require kinking like transcription factors and depressors. Just the binding and the flip, it flips out and then comes back. So very elegant mechanism first shown in DNA methyl transferase, and now a number of DNA transacting proteins you know, have been shown to have base flipping as a mechanism, as a part of a catalytic mechanism of how these enzymes catalyze reactions. So this is HHA1, which is the first example. Greg Verdine's lab in Harvard then did the second one, which is the H3, which is GGCC. That was GCGC, this is GGCC. And here, actually, two bases are actually distorted. In HHA1, only the one base is distorted, but here, actually, the adjacent base is also distorted. And only from crystallographic uh, think that people found out this. By no other methodology, biochemical method, that one could detect this uh, base flipping mechanisms. And then, you know, the uh, Sanger's group in Germany then did with the TAC1 DNA methyl transferase. The TAC1 DNA methyl transferase is an adenine methyl transferase. It's an A methyl transferase. It's an exocyclic methyl transferase. So to this amino group here, a CH3 is added here. Whereas the other two, uh, two cases, if you go back and see, these are ring methyl transferases. There are cytosines. The cytosine at the C5 position is actually methylated, whereas this is a ring methylation. So once uh, Rich, uh, Jardong in Rich Roberts' lab showed in 1994, everybody tried crystallizing their, pure, their favorite proteins to show that base flipping was occurring. And base flipping was very fashionable at that time. It's still, it's still a nice uh, mechanism to explain many things. Here's PVU2, another methyl transferase. We won't know the details of it, but this is a cytosine, but at the exocyclic position it's methylated. Not at the ring, this is C5 here, but this is an N4 methyl transferase. So whether you have N6 uh, methylation or a N4 methylation or a C5 methylation, there are examples where base flipping has been shown that at the usual mechanism, not necessarily every enzyme uses it, but most DNA methyl transferases use base flipping to do this whole catalysis here. Now I'm coming to my area of research and my work, I, my laboratory works on these enzymes called restriction modification enzymes of the type 3. Very few of them have been characterized. And actually most biochemistry has been done on P1 from bacteriophage P1 and from P15, a plasmid which is a common resident uh, plasmid in 15T minus strain. 
A lot of work was done in the 80s on Hinef 3, but Pikarowicz's group in Poland actually lost this train, so there's no, no information on Hinef 3 at all. Uh, then the others ones, which uh, Stai LT1 from Salmonella Typhimurium, and uh, these people have not done any much, uh, not much of biochemistry, and nobody else has taken up. But little that is available, I've summarized here. But now with genome sequencing projects and lots of genomes being sequenced, we find that type 3 enzymes are coming in a big way, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, there's something called phase variation in pathogenic organisms, and phase variation, uh, uh, the type 3 methyl transferases are all phase variable, and they contribute a lot to pathogenesis. I'll talk about it in the second half of my talk when I come to it. Now, the type 3 enzymes, as I said, these guys recognize the sequence and cut here. <clears throat> They're far away. The methyl transferase is the M alone. R and M also can methylate it, but M alone is a better methyl, tra methyl transferase. So we started working on the methyl transferase alone, the M alone, of both P1 and P15, but most of our work, which I'm going to present here, is on the P15 methyl transferase. A very robust enzyme, very solid, which is stable and uh, doesn't get inactivated. But so many years of work by others and our group, we still don't have a crystal structure for these enzymes. So it is still uh, you know, uh, fascinating to study because we would like to know how these enzymes actually recognize and cut DNA and methylate DNA. Now, if you take the restriction enzymes, uh, the type 3, the, the modification subunit and the restriction subunit. As I said, the modification subunit alone is a methyl transferase. And like all methyl transferases, like any other methyl transferase, you have this FXGXG, which is the SAM binding motif. And N6 methyl transferases have a motif called DPPY, which is the catalytic motif. In, in cytosine methyl transferase, you have PCQ. So these are catalytic motifs. You change any of these residues here, then the activity is lost. You change the residues here, SAM does not bind, the methylase is inactive. And you know, by site directed mutagenesis, people have shown, and we have shown, and I'm going to present a little bit of work of that. The restriction subunit, which I'm going to talk very little about uh, today, has all these very conserved classical helicase motifs. The Walker A motif, the Walker B motif, these are ATP binding. Because this enzyme requires ATP for cleavage, you have the helicase and the Walker motifs. I, like all endonucleases, any endonuclease you take, you have this motif called the PDXDXD motif, where because of this acidic residues, D and aspartate and glutamate, magnesium is actually coordinated to it. You mutate this D or E, then the magnesium cannot bind and therefore the enzyme is inactive. It's been shown for a number of restriction enzymes, eco R1, eco R5, BIMH1, PVU2 and things like that. But I want you to remember this. This is very of particular interest to our work, but this is in the restriction subunit. What I'm going to talk to you about is only about the methyl transferase. I will not have time to talk about the restriction uh, at this moment. Okay? So the methyl transferase, and I'm taking only one example, the P15 methyl transferase, which is listed here, uh, is 645 amino acids. It has the DPPY motif, which is important for catalysis. It has the SAM binding, which is important, FXGX. And there's also another region known as the DXDXDXD motif. I'll come to that later on. So this metal, uh, this enzyme methylates the second adenine in the sequence CAG, CAG. Okay, I better show it here. So it is this adenine which is methylated. And I'll show you results for this. It has both these motifs and any mutations in the motif will knock off the activity. And uh, I'll present some of that there. So this is what it is that these enzymes, uh, this particular enzyme, by using an oligonucleotide which has overlapping restriction sites, the enzyme recognizes the C, A, G, C, A, G, and the A is methylated. But if you design an oligonucleotide with PST1 and ALU1 site on this site, if this A is methylated or this A is methylated, then you cannot cut by PST1 or ALU1. And by doing very simple experiments like that, uh, a graduate student in my lab clearly showed that it is the second adenine that is actually methylated and not the first adenine. Okay, so that's the first thing. So in my enzyme, we normally overexpress, uh, we, we clone, overexpress, purify, and the idea is to do structure function analysis of all proteins. Whatever proteins we study, we like to overexpress and study the enzymology, the biochemistry of it. Mine is a biochemistry lab, and therefore, so with purified proteins, we first showed 
that the methyl transferase, the mod subunit of P15, can bind DNA. But before that, we showed that this is a dimer, both by gel filtration analysis and by cross-linking, cross-linking by glutaraldehyde or by dimethyl sugarimidate, as is shown here. That if you have neighboring, very nearby subunits, if they are, if a dimer, then you can actually make a covalent cross-linking. And by doing simple SDS page, you can show if this is a monomer, this is a dimer here. By gel filtration, as you purify the protein and you run a gel filtration chromatography, the protein eludes as a, with a molecular weight which corresponds to a dimer. So the P15 methyl transferase is a dimer. Now this is interesting because all other DNA methyl transferases, many of them, so far, when, before we reported this, were all monomers. They never occur in dimeric forms. But the type 3 methyl transferases occur in a dimeric form and there's biology to this, there's significance for this. Because the methyl transferase has to methylate DNA, it has to bind DNA, and by doing very simple mobility shift assays, gel retardation assays, by increasing the protein concentration here, you can see from the DNA, uh, as you increase the protein concentration, you can get a complex. And when you have this kind of a titration, you can measure the affinity for the protein and the DNA, and we calculated the dissociation constants from this. This is a rough dissociation constant that you get here. We also showed that with the type 3 methyl transferase that in presence of ATP the binding is much more. And remember the type 3 enzymes require ATP for DNA cleavage. So even binding is enhanced in the presence of ATP. You can see this is minus ATP and plus ATP. There's huge amount of affinity increase for this. So the role of ATP in the type 3 enzymes besides being shown that it's important for hydrolysis, is also important for sequence-specific binding, an increased sequence-specific binding that you see here. I've already shown you this particular slide where the motifs are present here. That is the modification subunit. So the first thing we did was to modify these residues or change these residues. And one such example here, when you change it and do the classical uh, uh, lambda, the efficiency of plating assay, when you score for efficiency of modification uh, in different backgrounds, and you find that mutating these residues, for example, uh, the, in the FXGSG or in the DPP by the EOP is drastically reduced. So this is the first indication that these residues were important. We then cloned them, overexpressed them, purified, and did experiments, biochemical experiments. So you take a purified methyl transferate, you add radioactive SAM, which is tritium labeled, flash UV light, it will be cross-linked and then run an SDS page. So on an SDS page, you can see here, when you have the wild type and you have the mutants, for example, because they are important for FXG, there's no binding at all, and whereas in the wild type, you find this. So by using very simple assay like cross-linking and on SDS page, you can actually score for many of the properties of this function, of this mutation. And this is what we did with a number of mutants. I'm going to skip these two slides because there's lack of time, but these are a number of mutations that we have done to show what are the residues important for SAM binding. You must not go back with the idea that just that motif FXGXG is important. There are other residues in three-dimensional which also can form a part of the SAM binding site. So we mapped some of these things without having a structure. This is doing it in a black box. You keep changing and then try to accumulate what we have. Now, we are no crystallographers. Although we have a very strong crystallography group in, in, uh, at the Institute of Science where I, I, I work, Professor G.N. Ramachandran, I'm sure all of you must have studied the Ramachandran plot, is actually from my institute. But we never had success with crystallizing these proteins. And crystallization is important. And we still want to crystallize it when we have given out this protein to a number of people. But one of the things we wanted to show when the base flipping was shown by Rich Roberts' lab, we wanted to do a non-crystallographic approach. And the non-crystallographic approach to show base flipping was you take oligonucleotides here, which are listed here. The enzyme recognizes CAG, CAG, and the darkened A is what is methylated. You can replace adenine by a fluorescent isomer called 2-aminopurine. 
And two amino purine is almost like adenine. Even polymerase can incorporate. It doesn't make a difference at all. It hydrogens bonds with the T on the opposite side. But except that it is fluorescent now. Okay? So what we did was to do here that this is the normal oligo. We replace the adenine here, the target adenine with two amino purines. So we commercially got it synthesized. And then did the fluorescence experiment. In the fluorescence experiment, what you do is to take this oligonucleotide, the top strand which has a two amino purine, and flash UV, do a fluorescence experiment. It has a characteristic absorption, a fluorescence emission spectrum. So if you take an oligonucleotide, for example, here, I'll show it here. This is what the single stranded oligo will show. It's nice fluorescence you get. Now you add the other, other sequence, the duplex, and because of base stacking interactions, this fluorescence will be quenched. Okay? Because of stacking interactions. Now you add the enzyme. If that two amino purine is flipped out, you should get back fluorescence. And that is how we got a huge amount of fluorescence. So this was an evidence, a non-crystallographic evidence, that you have base flipping in this metal transferase. But this is the adenine that we replaced by two amino purine. So the graduate student in my lab, Banker, said, let's put this two amino purine in this position. Here also we got the same result. So we were very disappointed. We thought it was an artifact of this whole thing. And then I suggested that let's put one uh, two amino purine outside the sequence, somewhere far away, and we don't find this. But what this experiment clearly told us, that when the enzyme binds to that sequence, there is distortion in the DNA around, very localized distortion that we find this. It is no proof of base flipping, but we know there is a big distortion. And distortion is measured by the two amino purine. So we did another experiment called the potassium permanganate footprinting. Now footprinting, especially potassium permanganate footprinting is very nice. Remember that is CAG, CAG, and as opposite A you have T, right? Now if the A is flipped out, the T is exposed. And the T can be oxidized in a single stranded DNA by using potassium permanganate. And when you do that and do all the controls, you find there is one which is hyperreactive because that T has been exposed. All the other T's are intact. Whereas this T, which is opposite A, which was flipped out, you have a very nice band here. So by combination of fluorescence experiments, steady state fluorescence experiment, and by uh, uh, potassium permanganate, we think that the enzyme, our enzyme, the P15 enzyme, binds and distorts DNA and probably flips. But only crystallographic evidence is a final proof for these kind of things. But that is because we were working on the metal transferase. To our surprise, when we were doing measurements, simple measurements, activity measurements, you know, measuring specific activity of the enzyme, we found that only in presence of magnesium that you have activity. You must remember that metal transferases don't require any metal ion. You take DNA, you take enzyme, you take uh, uh, SAM, and you get methylation. In, but in our case, if we don't add magnesium, and you see that as a dependence on the concentration, you get activity. You use any other metals, manganese, calcium, ferrous, you can go through the whole the periodic table. It will not work at all. But magnesium is very essential for our metal transferase. And strangely, this is the only metal transferase which requires, at that time when we showed, required magnesium or metal ion for activity. So we were very keen to find out what is the role of this magnesium. Why, why, where does it help in base flipping? In the catalytic mechanism, how does it work? So there's very old technique, very, very old, 1894. There's a paper in the Journal of Chemical Society known as the Fenton Reaction. A Fenton reaction generates uh, radicals, oxygen radicals. And you use ferrous sulfate and ascorbate. Even peptide bonds, which very close to a metal binding thing, can be hydrolyzed. Just like cyanogen bromide cuts peptide bonds, you can use ferrous sulfate and ascorbate and actually cleave peptide bonds. So this experiment, we actually did this experiment. We took the pure enzyme. And we found that when you increase this ferrous sulfate, you actually get, there are actually two bands here. But the molecular weight is so close that you can't make it out. That they so we took these two fragments, sequenced them, amino acid sequence, and found that this is a 
nice metal binding site that we have here. This is a metal binding site just like in restriction enzymes, like PDXDXD motif, but instead of proline, we have a methionine instead. So this is the usual one which we have here, but we have a methionine here, but not a proline. All other endonucleases have a proline. They have a proline and aspartate in a series of acidic residues. So Pradeep Bisht in my lab, who was a postdoctoral fellow, mutated all these residues and showed that the metal cannot bind, the magnesium cannot bind, and an intact PDXDXD motif is very important. You must remember, if, I, if you go back, we also found there is a DXDXDXD motif here in our protein. But if you mutate any of these things, there is no loss of activity. It is this region, which is right in the center, that you have a magnesium binding site. So this is the first time a metal transferase has been shown to require a metal ion. We have identified the metal binding site, but it's not exactly like the restriction enzyme site, but instead of a proline, we have a methionine. So these are all site-directed mutagenesis experiments of various mutations in the DXDXD to show that you have cleavage. Uh, which don't uh, metal it in. So we did the CD spectra. We purified all these proteins, the wild type protein, and as you add magnesium chloride, you can see a change in the CD spectra, that the secondary structure is changing, conformation is changing, and this enzyme, even though uh, you see here that in, in presence of magnesium, you get more and more base flipping. So as far as the role of magnesium was concerned, it was important for base flipping. It somehow stabilized that extra helical base which came out. But again, as I said, this is all done in the absence of a structure. So you have to be very, very careful when you postulate this. So the sequence alignment of this motif was, is shown here, and we found that it's also present in the P1 modification subunit, which I won't talk about it. And then later on, we found that there were reports in literature that many metal transferases, when you added enzyme, metal ion, they either stimulated or inhibited, so metal had an effect. But ours is the only one which actually requires a metal. Without a metal ion, it does not methylate DNA at all. So that was the first interesting finding here. And because most of the endonucleases have a proline and we had a methionine, we now took this metal transferase of ours and changed this M to a proline, okay, by side-directed mutagenesis. So we're working on the methyl transferase. So if you take the wild type, this is a PGEM vector uh, system, and then you transform it on amplase, you get colonies. But if you make the site-directed mutant, that M357 to P, and plate it, you don't see anything at all. Suggesting that it must be killing, there must be something that kills the cells. But when you transform this plasmid in the background of the other methyl transferase, so you use two different antibiotics, chloramphenicol and AMP, and you plate it on the AMP chloramphenicol, you can get plates here. These are very classical experiments done to show restriction activity of uh, you know, plasmids and things like that. So we took plasmids from here, which have both the wild type and the mutant, mutation in one residue, and actually purified the enzyme by a very uh, indirect method. The enzyme behaves exactly. It's a 75 kilo Dalton on SDS. The wild type is also 75 kilo Dalton. And we found that the mutant has hardly any metal transferase activity. The wild type has a robust metal transferase. You change the, P, uh, the M to P, you lose activity, but you change M to A, there's not much loss of activity. Only the P mutation, you're losing activity quite a lot. So we wanted to characterize this enzyme more and more even gel filtration, there are no change in properties. That one residue, in many cases, can change properties, but in our case, we find that everything is the same, except that it's an inactive methylase, and more importantly, that uh, I'll skip some of the slides. But when you do a restriction digestion, when you use plasmid DNA and use now the methyl transferase, which is modified, it now converts supercoiled DNA to linear DNA. So one change in the metal transferase converts the metal transferase to an endonuclease. Now, this is a very interesting observation. 
But if you send it to journals at this stage, they will say it is the Ganges water or the rivers of India are all contaminated with endonucleus <laughs> and they will never buy it. So for four years, we worked on this, giving the clone to a lot of people at NEB and others to confirm that this was what was happening. And we also confirmed by using, if you use the alanine but, um, um, mutation, there is no cleavage at all. The wild type, there is no cleavage, but the P mutant actually linearizes supercalled DNA to a linear DNA. So we're very sure about this particular activity. Again, we showed by a variety of, now we're coming to, coming to a little bit of restriction here, that the DNA cleavage by the methyl transferase is independent of the orientation of these sites. Remember the type 3 enzymes, I forgot to mention, that you require two sites in opposite orientation. If you have sites in the same orientation, the type 3 enzyme will not cut. But this methyl transferase converted endonuclease is independent of all this. It definitely requires CAG, CAG by experiments which I'll show you, but uh, the orientation is not at all important. So in other words, with one metal transfer, with one change, one amino acid change, we have converted a metal transferase to an endonucleus. We've done a lot of kinetics because the referees wanted us to do proper kinetics of uh, DNA cleavage by using a variety of substrates to show that this cleavage was a genuine activity. And if you don't have that CAG, CAG sites, there is no cleavage by either the proper restriction enzyme of P15 or the methyl transferase. So you require the CAG, CAG site and then only have cleavage here. This is again steady state kinetics to show and therefore we find that magnesium is required for the methylation and a methyl transferase can be changed to an endonucleus because you've changed one amino acid at the metal binding site. And my students and uh, us have uh, been very excited about this, so we have actually mapped where it cleaves. It doesn't cleave 25-27 uh, base away. The methyl transferase alone recognizes the sequence and cuts in a very odd manner here. We have actually done this method. And therefore, because of this magnesium requirement, we think this is a magnificent methyl transferase. So this kept us busy for quite some time. But we still don't have the structure for this protein. Uh, now, Janusz and uh, uh, Detlef Kruger, these are the, th the three groups that work on this, we have now formed a model and we have done some very preliminary uh, large angle, small angle measurements, uh, Sachs analysis to get the shape of this molecule. And we're just writing up this paper here. So the methyl transferases are very interesting. They not only methylate DNA, but all these biochemical properties allowed us to explore this and find out very interesting things about methyl transferase. But P15 methyl transferase is just one, one methyl transferase. There are a variety of methyl transferases and they come in different flavors. Many of them, as you see in genomes, for example, you have, uh, you usually have an R and M, but now you have an R, M1, M2. And M1, M2 can be an adenine methylase, a cytosine methylase, an N4 methylase, a C. So you have a variety of these and most metal transferases which don't recognize paleodromic sequences, which recognize asymmetric sequences like the P15 and the P1 enzyme, come in a variety of uh, very interesting manners. And to study each of them is fascinating. You can't say all metal transferases are the same. They're all the same in one sense, but you know, the, the way they do their job is quite interesting. And that is what keeps most of us interesting. An important thing which I mentioned about the oligomeric status of this protein. P15 was a dimer. But you find in literature, more recently, a number of metal transferases, all thought to be monomers, are now shown to be dimers. More and more metal transferases. It looks like most metal transferases are dimers. <coughs> so, uh, you, we, also, we also have to believe that you know restriction enzymes uh, all of us think cut only paleodromic sequences, but now in the in, in the nature there are more enzymes which cut non-paleodromic sequences. So similarly, dimers are very common among metal transferases, and therefore there's a lot of attempt to understand dimeric interface, uh, dimeric metal transferases. So again, with collaboration with Janusz Bushnishki uh, and my, uh, and we, we we actually worked on this enzyme called the KPN1 from Klebsiella and pneumonia the methyl transferase. Uh, actually, uh, these are the structures and uh, 
by biochemistry, by kinetics, we showed that the enzyme is a dimer, and by bioinformatics and modeling studies, Yanush actually modeled this for us to show it's a dimer. Again, we don't have a structure of this, and we are trying very hard to get the structure of this. And once we have a model, then you have a dimerization interface, then you make mutations and show that the dimer interrupts, and then the activity is completely lost. By gel filtration, you show dimer and monomer, and this is what has been done. So my laboratory has been working on methyl transferases, mostly on the type 3, but also on these other methyl transferases. And I'm going to tell you about, after the break, on the helicobacter methyl transferases. And most of this work on the type 3 uh, have been done by those, that, that lot of people. Uh, the lab also works on uh, type 2. Uh, we have worked on DNA repair and, uh, of course, a helicobacter, which I'm going to tell you in the next half after the coffee. So I'll take uh, questions now and uh, we'll continue after this. Thank you.